Okay, so quick review from yesterday. If I'm going to write the name of the compound, the first thing I need to do is what? Identify it as ionic or molecular. Okay, and I tell that by the presence of a metal or a non-metal. Yeah, but if it's got a metal listed first, it's ionic. Okay, that's basically what we're looking for. Uh, then, once I've decided that, then I follow the proper naming rules. Okay, other things I have to look for, it came up in this one. Okay, if it's ionic, does the metal have more than one possible charge? If it does, I'm going to have to put what in the name? A Roman numeral. Okay, and we did that with this one here. Okay, we wrote that this would be chromium fluoride. Okay, but then we had to look up what Roman numeral it was going to be. So we looked at the non-metal. Fluorine's charge is always minus one. There are three fluorine atoms, which means there are three negative charges that have to be balanced by that single chromium atom. So that single chromium atom must have a charge of three plus. So we go chromium one, two, three, fluoride. Okay, so you only have to do that for certain ionic compounds. When you have an ionic compound, check the metal to make sure if it needs Roman numerals or not. It only needs them if there's more than one charge listed for it. Okay, the third one there had um, two non-metals, so it was molecular, so we just wrote phosphorus tribromide, okay, um, putting in the prefixes for the molecular ones. All right, now remember that you could come up against ones like number nine. Let's just quickly review how number nine is going to work. Is this an ionic compound or a molecular compound? Ionic. Calcium is a metal. Okay? And anytime you've got a polyatomic ion in, polyatomic ion would apply ionic as well. Okay? Um, so I'd simply write this stuff is calcium, and then I look up the name of this polyatomic ion on my periodic table. Okay? SO4 is sulfate. Okay? That one technically doesn't need brackets because there's no number outside of it. Alright, is that ringing a bell? Once you guys to finish those up, we'll go through the rest of them. The question happens if there's a number of uh, It doesn't affect the name at all, it's just from the drop and swap. Just make sure the charge is balanced. Right? So if we're looking at uh, beryllium cyanide, cyanide has a charge of minus one. So, and beryllium has a charge of plus two. So when we made this compound and did the drop and swap, which we'll talk about today, okay, the two came down here. Right? But I have to put those brackets there so that two applies to both and not just the end. Okay, I'll give you a few more minutes to finish those ones up and then we'll go through them. All right, uh, for number eight, this is our first one that is not only an ionic compound, but that also has a polyatomic ion in it. Okay, so it's very much like calcium sulfate over here. Okay, so um, naming rules still apply. It's still an ionic compound, so I name the metal first, sodium, and then I simply name the polyatomic ion change anything about that. So this is very simply sodium hydroxide. Okay. This is the active ingredient in oven cleaner. Okay. So if you've ever sprayed that white foamy stuff on the inside of your oven to clean it out, it's got a very um, strong smell and it can burn your eyes and nasal passages if you get it in them. Okay. Uh, it's very, it is, but that's why it can dissolve the crud off the inside of your oven. Okay. So when you, if you ever use this stuff, okay, people make this mistake all the time. They stick their head in the oven while they're spraying it. It's very bad. Okay. Stick your arm in. Okay. You can look from the outside. You definitely don't want to get that stuff in your eyes or inhale it because it's an extremely strong base. Okay. And, and it will do just the same kind of damage that a strong acid would do. It will actually like, eat away at your tissue, which would be bad. All right. Um, how many people have done number 10? So same idea with number 10, we've got a, an ionic compound, because potassium is a metal, and permanganate is a polyatomic ion, so this stuff is potassium permanganate. Okay, um, that stuff is little purple crystals. Okay, they're very pretty, uh, but you don't want to play with them, because they will stain your skin dark brown, okay? So if you're um, like very fair skinned, your fingers will turn brown, okay, wherever you touch them, right? I once had a kid who never, ever listened to me. No, 
not ever. Okay? And I told the whole class here, we're going across the hall, we're gonna be using this stuff. Okay? It's potassium permanganate, don't touch it. It's not gonna hurt you, but it'll stain your fingers. They're pretty little crystals, don't play with them. Sure enough, not five minutes later, he comes up with a sample tray and doing this. Mr. Cadet, these are so cool. Uh-huh, you remember what I told you? No. Nope. Look at your fingers. This kid was like pasty white skinned and his fingers all the way around to the first knuckle were just brown. Like, don't put that finger in your ear. You don't know where that finger's been brown. Uh, a couple weeks, you can't wash it off. It's a stain. <laughs> okay, it's like it's basically like uh, like henna. Okay, like if you've ever seen what that would be, that's yeah. yeah. It was it was funny though because he totally deserved it. Yeah. All right, uh, how many people have done number eleven? Okay, let's have a look at number eleven. So uh, we got nitrogen and we got oxygen. Okay, both non-metals. So this is a molecular. molecular compound. So we have nitrogen. And do we need a prefix on that one? Yes. No, no it's on first. Not on, right? not on that one, but we do on oxygen and okay. monoxide. All right, I'll give you a couple more minutes to finish up the last uh, five, four there. Okay, and we'll uh, finish those up. Then we'll talk about writing formulas. Okay, let's have a look at the last few here. All right, so for number 12, we've got beryllium, which is a metal, with cyanide, which is a uh, polyatomic ion, also highly poisonous. Okay? Cyanide bonds to certain parts of your cell's uh, mechanics and makes it so that they cannot carry out cellular respiration. If you get cyanide poisoning, okay, it can uh, basically just make you fall asleep and, and pass away because all your your cells can't burn sugar anymore. Okay? And, uh, yeah, so you gotta watch out for that one. Okay? If you watch any like spy movies and stuff, that's what the, the poison tooth usually has in it. You know, the, the suicide tool kind of thing, right? They bite on the tooth. Yeah. Okay? That's cyanide. Okay? It's a very common poison. Okay? Uh, beryllium cyanide. Okay, um, and then for this one here, we've got barium, also a metal with cyanide again. So this will very simply be barium cyanide. Okay, for number 14, we've got sodium with HCO3. Okay, so what's HCO3? Hydrogen carbonate. Okay, so this stuff is sodium hydrogen carbonate. You may also know this as baking soda. And for number 15, we've got phosphorus and oxygen, non-metal and non-metal. So this one is molecular, okay, and we will name it phosphorus tetraoxide. All right, are you okay with that? So we spent the last couple of days looking at how to write the names for ionic and molecular compounds. Okay. Every time you got one of these, I gave you the formula, you came up with the name. Now we've got to look at how to do that in reverse. That's actually what we do more often. Okay. You get like a reaction written out in words and you would have to write it out with formulas and balance it and that's the stuff we're moving towards. So that's what we have to look at next. Okay. So how do we do that? Um, so let's say I give you this name here. Let's say I go... Um, all right, so I gave you the name sodium iodide. Is that an ionic compound or a molecular compound? Ionic. It's ionic. Sodium is a metal. All right, if I want to write the formula for this compound, what I first do is I write the symbols for each one of the elements that's involved. The symbol for sodium, Na. Symbol for iodine, Okay. The next thing I do is I put the charges of both elements beside them up top. Okay. This, the charge on sodium is plus one. The charge on iodine is minus one. And this is where we do the drop and swap. Okay. Now, in this one, do I even need to bother with the drop and swap? No. Plus one and minus one already add up to zero. So this compound is already written correctly, because we don't write once. 
Okay, in a formula, you never write a one. Okay. What if I gave you this one instead? Um, Sulfide. So same steps here. I need to write the symbols for both of the elements. Okay? The symbol for potassium is K. The symbol for sulfur is S. And then I write the charges. Okay? The charge on potassium is plus 1. The charge on sulfur is minus 2. Now I do have to do the drop as well. So I take the 2 and I put it down here. I take the 1, I put it there, but we don't write once. And now we're done. K2S. Okay. That drop and swap makes sure that our charges are balanced out. There's one sulfur with a charge of minus 2. There are two potassiums, each with a charge of plus 1. Okay, so we got two positives, two negatives. Compound has a net charge of 0. That's why we do the drop and swap. We make sure that the charges end up balancing out. Now, a couple little things with the drop and swap that we have to be mindful of, right? We could end up with a situation like this. Lead four sulfide. Right? We start this out the same as we have all the other ones. I write out the symbol for lead, PB. I let it write out the symbol for sulfur, S. And then I put in their charges. What's the charge on sulfur? Same as it was here, minus 2. What's the charge on lead? 2 or 4. But the name tells me that I'm using four. the 4. That's why we put the Roman numeral there. Okay? So that now when someone's building the formula, they know this is the lead with the 4 plus charge. So I know which one to use in the drop and swap. Okay, so now I know it's plus 4 on one side, minus 2 on the other. So I drop and swap, okay, and I'm going to get 2 and 4. Do I leave it that way? The answer is I don't. Compounds, ionic compounds, are like fractions. You should always reduce them. I reduce 2 and 4. Yeah, yeah it's down to 1 and 2. Okay, and that's what I should do. All right, that happens a fair amount and people forget about it. Okay, but um, ionic compounds always form in the lowest multiple. Okay, so we should have PDS. So I follow the same rules I followed for all the others. I write the symbol for copper, Cu. I write the symbol for nitrate. What's the symbol for nitrate? That's nitride. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion. This is one of the things we always have to watch for. If it doesn't end in I, it's probably in the table of polyatomic ions. There's a few polyatomic ions that end in I, but most of them end in I or eight. Okay? So, Nitrate is NO3. Now I need to write the charges. Okay? According to your table of polyatomic ions, the charge on nitrate is just a dash. That's negative 1. Okay? If it just has a minus sign beside it, it's minus 1. And what's the charge on copper? 2, because the Roman numeral tells me that. All right. Now I need to drop and swap. So the 1 
is going to drop and swap over to here, but I don't write ones. The two is going to drop and swap over to here. What do I have to do before I write that two? I have to put brackets around it, okay? Because if I just do this, that means one copper, one nitrogen, and 32 oxygens. Not the same as one copper and two nitrates. Very, very different, okay? That bracket is necessary there so that we don't get them confused. Do you keep the three there? Yes, you keep the three there. That number is, is, is not ever gonna change when you're doing the drop and swap, okay? It's kinda like, this is what I gave you. You can't change it. You can put it with other stuff, but you can't change it. So, question at the back? All right, that's as tricky as they get in terms of writing the formulas for an ionic compound. Okay? We just have to drop and swap, and sometimes we have to remember Roman numerals and brackets. All right, writing the formulas for molecular compounds is really easy. Why? What's always going to be in the name? The prefix, and the prefix tells me what number to write. Okay? So I don't have to drop and swap a molecular compound or anything like that. I just have to read the name, so if I had okay, dinitrogen, all right, so I write the symbol for nitrogen, di means two, monophosphide, P, done, okay, I don't have to think at all, do the molecular ones, I just have to pay attention. Everybody okay with that? We do this part way more often, like I said before. Okay? Like going from name to formula is what we do most often, but there's a lot less rules to remember than there is with all the naming. Okay. All right, so if we're converting chemical names to formulas, the first step is to identify if it's ionic or molecular, because if it's ionic, we'll have to drop and swap, we'll have to worry about the charges, all of that kind of stuff, maybe use brackets, what do the Roman numerals mean, okay, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so we write out the formula for the metal with its charge, write out the formula for the nonmetal with its charge, drop and swap, done. Okay, if we need brackets, we use them. Okay, for molecular ones, all we do is write the formula for each element involved in the compound and then use the prefixes to tell us what numbers to write. Now, what if I got a molecular compound and it looked like this? Would I reduce that? Why? Because I don't have to balance charges with a molecular compound. Remember that in a molecular compound, all the electrons are shared. So if they tell you that this was diphosphorus tetraoxide, that's what it is, okay? The prefixes are fixed, okay? We go with them, we write those numbers. You only reduce ionic compounds, and that's because of the nature of the charge balance, okay? But with molecular compounds, if they tell you that's the number, that's the number. All right, questions on those rules? I would like you guys to try up to, let's say, number six, and then we'll go through those together. All right, so we're gonna start out with calcium phosphide, okay? So that's gonna be Ca for calcium with a two plus charge, phosphide with a minus three charge, okay? So it's ionic, because calcium is a metal. Now what do we do with those charges? Drop and swap. CA3, P2. Questions on that one? All right. Cesium oxide. So we got CS, has a charge of plus one. Oxygen, has a charge of minus two. Ionic compound, drop and swap. CS2O. Okay. Uh, so Next one here, manganese four oxide. The four is telling us what charge to use on manganese. It's obviously an ionic compound because we don't have uh, molecular compounds with Roman numerals. Okay, so it's telling us use the manganese with the four plus charge. It's with oxygen, which is a minus two. Okay, and this one has that reduction thing going on. This would normally be a two and a four, but I can reduce two and four down to one and a two. So we're looking at MnO2 for that one. Okay. For iron 2 sulfide, again, we've got a Roman numeral in there. Iron's a metal. Okay. So this is Fe, 
the Roman numeral tells me to use the two plus charge. It's with sulfur that has a minus two charge. Those already add up to zero, okay? Or if I drop the two and the two, I can reduce it to one and one. Either way, I end up with FES. Okay, and then we've had this one already, potassium permanganate, but it was going the other way, okay? Potassium is a plus one, it's a metal, okay? Permanganate is a polyatomic ion, MnO4. It has a minus one charge. Those are already balanced. My formula is KMN. And then our last one, silver chloride. Silver's a metal, so I know I have to do the charges here. Okay, so AG with a plus one. Chlorine with a minus one. Those are already balanced, AGCl. Okay, everybody all right with that? Okay, so we're gonna practice this stuff a little bit. We've got a few worksheets in our um, digital workbook package, so if we just go to Google Classroom on your phone, okay, that's where you'll find those. Okay. So, um, you'll also notice that I posted in the stream here the keys for all the worksheets to do with naming. Okay, so it's the most recent post. So if you're working on a worksheet, make sure you have that file open as well. Okay, and my suggestion is this, like do three or four, then check the key. Okay, don't do a whole page and then check the key. Because if, if you've been doing something wrong, all you've been doing is practicing doing it wrong like 35 times. Okay, and that'll be a hard habit to break. So do four, check and see if you did it right. If there's some you didn't get, then that's a good time to ask me. Okay, just put your hand up or come on up and I'll help you with that. All right, everybody with me here? Okay, so the, uh, the worksheets, okay, without the answers on them, are in the classwork tab, in the worksheet booklets, in the chemistry one. And they are right after the questions that we did the other day. Okay, and the one that we were working on okay, is right here, right underneath question number 12 where it says predicting formulae for compounds. Okay, so it's the bottom of page two, moving on to page three. Okay, that's the one we're working on right now. So if you can call that one up on your phone, you'll be able to see further than I can show you on the board right now. Okay. Um, working on those, so I'll just, we've done the first six. Okay, and then obviously you can check the key as you go. Okay, if you have questions, please ask. 